The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right, are we ready to start? I'd like to introduce Jason Hibberts from uh, opensource.com, a Red Hat project. Um, I'm making out of an open source city. Everyone give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks to the peanut gallery up front. They'll be heckling me throughout the talk, so don't worry about them. Uh, well, hey, everyone, uh, welcome to Southeast Linux Fest, as the veterans say, self. Um, this is my second year here, first year speaking, so I'm happy to be here. Today I want to talk with you about the making of an open source city, and really it's a collection of stories around um, open source and open government, uh, things happening in Raleigh, North Carolina, just a few minutes down the road. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Jason Hibbets. I'm a project manager at Red Hat. Uh, my main project is opensource.com. We have a booth uh, out in the hallway, so you can come by and talk with us afterwards if you haven't already. What our mission is, is to basically highlight how open source is being used beyond technology and really show how open source is being applied to different disciplines like business and education, uh, health, law, and just uh, government, of course, uh, and really general life. You know? So we like to talk about things like music and video and uh, open source solar power. And we've got a, a handout today about the, uh, zombie, uh, guide, the open source guide to the zombie apocalypse and basically how you can make your own food and make your own solar power and do all this cool open hardware stuff uh, that'll help you survive the zombie apocalypse if that ever comes, which it may be here tomorrow. So we've got a guide to help you get through that. Anyway, um, really what, what I've discovered over the last few months is that I found a way to combine all the things that I'm passionate about, and that's open source, my local community, which happens to be Raleigh, North Carolina, and my uh, passion for civic participation. So I'm really, really involved. Um, hold on one second here. I'm on auto time. Um, really involved in uh, local politics, to say, but um, how do I cut this off? But really just involved in my local community. And so, you know, I got started way back in the day with a a road paving project, so I know much more about um, the NC Department of Transportation than I should. And one moment for my technical difficulties. There we go. And uh, so like I said, I know much more about the NCDOT than I should, um, but uh, I got involved with that thing and it just kind of stuck. I had to learn all these processes with Raleigh City Government and, and, uh, and the state, so I just kind of stuck with it and, and really, uh, over the last few years applied what I've learned at Red Hat through open source to my local community. And that's things like starting up a local mailing list, uh, which a lot of people in open source are very familiar with. That's how we communicate. And so uh, just taking little things like that and, and giving it to people who weren't uh, exposed to it. And so the way I combined all my three passions, so it was through this movement called Open Government. And, uh, and when people think of government, I think they think of voting or lobbying or all the things that government is not well known for or that people are put off by. But really for me, open government is about citizen participation and making government work better for us. And I found, found a couple of great ways to do that, which I'll talk about today. So all the way at the top level, uh, when soon after President Obama took office, he enacted this thing called the Open Government Initiative. And it highlights three core principles that we should all be familiar with from an open source perspective. And that's transparency, participation, and collaboration. And so I like to think that they borrowed those from open source, which is totally cool. Um, but it resonates with me because I've been using those principles for years uh, in my open source world. And so what I've been doing over the last year, last few months, um, I kind of summarize it as the path to the open source city. So it's this initiative, it's an open government initiative in Raleigh to make the city more open source, to make our government more accessible, and to bring in um, the citizens, to make them part of the process not part of the process as far as like, hey, go attend this meeting, but actually coming up with solutions and, and creating solutions. And, and I've got a great story about that. But first, just so we're on the same page, um, 
in case someone is not familiar with open source, uh, I'm just going to give a really high level def definition so we can have a base knowledge of it. It's really when you use, uh, people are familiar with it from the software side. When you're using software, the source code is available and uh, you have the ability to modify it and to also share out your modifications. So I'll leave it at that. I won't go into the, the big legal terms around some of that. Uh, and my, uh, my intern this year likes, I just wrote an article, open source is like sharing a recipe. And so I think it's a great analogy because if you bake a cookie and give it to your friend and they like the cookie, that's awesome. They can have it, but they can't make the cookie again. So if you make the cookie and give them the recipe, they're free to modify it. They're free to make it themselves. They can add more chocolate chips if they like more chocolate chips. And then they're free to share that recipe with their friends and family. Anyone think open source is just for software in the room? No? Good. Well, for me, open source is, is more than just software. It's actually a way of life, and it's, uh, it's a way to do things. And I like to summarize all the kind of principles around open source, rapid prototyping, collaboration, transparency, uh, you know, with all eyes, bugs are fixed, all those things into one term called the open source way. And uh, the great thing is, is, I, is I and many other people get to talk about this on opensource.com. And so one of the things we like to talk about the most is uh, failing faster or this kind of um, mentality of rapid iteration. And so failing faster combined with our release early and re release often mentality. This is getting things out there faster so people can react to them and provide feedback. Uh, and, and, and it creates basically um, open innovation. And if you like to talk about these type of things and, and these type of principles, then uh, my brief commercial break is I, I invite you to, to join us on opensource.com. We're collecting stories about open source and uh, we're always looking for new contributors. And so if, if you've got stories about that, we'd love to hear from you. Back on with the show. Uh, so for me, uh, this path to the open source city started last year. And uh, I, s I got an interview with the mayor of Raleigh, sat in his office, and he talks really fast. So I had to type faster than normal. And um, we had the discussion around what an open source city would look like for, for Raleigh. And we looked at you know, the landscape of other cities and you know, you've got places like New York and Chicago and Portland where they've got open government directives already passed. Um, so Raleigh was really kind of behind the ball. And so we did this interview and then we shared our story with the world saying, Raleigh is ambitious. We're not quite there yet, but this is where we want to be. So it was kind of a roadmap into getting us to, uh, to be more open source and be more, um, be more friendly towards open source. Shortly after I published that, I got involved with an initiative called City Camp. It's a national or international unconference series that brings open government to local municipalities. And it's really focused on enabling uh, citizens to find solutions for their city. For us, it was finding, uh, using technology to make our quality of life better uh, in the city of Raleigh. And I've got a, a great story that just happened last week that I'll share. One of the things that happened after our first City Camp Raleigh, um, June of last year, was a project called Triangle Wiki. This wasn't uh, an idea that was pitched at the unconference, or, um, but it was basically something that came out of the people that were involved with City Camp. Uh, a, one, a guy named Reed Sarozzi is kind of the, the ringleader in this area. Um, he had actually seen the software called Local Wiki. It's an open source wiki platform uh, several years ago. And he said, man, wouldn't it be great to bring this to the Triangle region in North Carolina? Well, it's kind of hard to build a wiki as, a one, as one person, right? You kind of need a team, you need some people dedicated to it. So he likes to say that he found his tribe of people at City Camp. And over the course of the fall and the winter, they started building the local wiki platform uh, for the Triangle area. Then in February of this year, we held uh, an event called Triangle Wiki Day. We had about 50 people show up and, on Saturday morning, including two city councilors and our Raleigh planning director. And, um, and we created over 100 new wiki pages, added over 120 new images in the course of just a few hours. And really, you know, we, we could have created more content, but this was more of a learning opportunity for many people. So we taught them how to create wiki pages, which is very easy. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, Google Docs. Um, you know, on, on a platform, because you don't have all the, the markup that you need. It's very simple. And you can see on the graph here uh, in February, that big spike right between February and March is our Triangle Wiki Day. And so 
a lot of people have been talking about the, basically this, type, this content sprint that happened uh, during this day. And about three weeks after we held this, they officially launched, right? So the Triangle Wiki Day served as a soft launch for this project. They wanted to get to 1,000 pages by their full launch, which was mid-March, and they accomplished that goal, uh, mostly in part because of this Triangle Wiki Day. So on another aspect of this is kind of the, the community building side of open source, right? We're building community here. We're teaching people how to teach other people. And really, the biggest problem that we have here is people come to the organizers and ask permission to do things. And we're like, you can go do it yourself. We don't need to be part of, of your wiki day. Um, we're glad to, but you, know, you can feel free to go organize it. You don't need to ask permission to do this. And this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, this is Matt Tomasula. He actually, he's a grad student at NC State and UNC. In fact, he just graduated in May. And he's done a number of things. Uh, he's interested in urban planning. And he did, uh, his first project was called City Fabric. And he basically takes GIS um, map data and puts it on t-shirts and prints and bags and, and totes and things like that. Uh, and so that was kind of a first business, business experiment that he did. Well, he did this thing, it's kind of been dubbed as guerrilla urban warfare. And his whole goal was to get more people to walk, right? So he walks around the city of Raleigh, but he doesn't see a lot of other people walking. And, and if, you know, I think Charlotte's probably a little bit different, but you know, he wanted other people to walk and he thought, how can I get more people to walk? So he put up these signs that said, instead of it's two miles this way, it's a five minute walk to this place where you know, these kind of uh, locations where people might wanna go, these destination places. And so you know, he used color coding, green for parks and, and blue for, uh, for commerce. And uh, he didn't just stop there, right? So there were some intricacies with the sign ordinance in Raleigh that have been resolved since, uh, since this. He uses zip ties to time here, so there's no damage to public property. But um, Matt basically said, he came to me and said, hey man, I'm really interested in how other cities can do this. How can we basically open source this Walk Your City project so that anyone can print out a sign and have some sort of similarity and, and have the same format and some consistency? And, uh, and so he did that. He did a Kickstarter project. He got funded at over 200%, and now he's pursuing um, basically how to cr um, enable people to create these signs for their city. Well, then uh, earlier this year, the dominoes started to fall as far as uh, on the path to the open source city. In uh, early February, the city council unanim unanimously passed an open government directive or open government resolution. And so what that did is two things. It put open source software on an equal playing field uh, from a procurement standpoint. So when the IT department goes out and looks for an IT solution, now they have to look at an open source solution. They didn't go as far and say it has to be open source, but at least it has equal footing uh, from that perspective. The second part of that is to launch an open data portal, which I'll talk about in just a moment. On the open data portal side, um, the city also allocated $50,000 towards that. So the interesting part here is that uh, we're in the budget process currently, and this is the first time in 10 years that the city council has told the city manager to basically earmark $50,000 for this special thing. Normally the process is the city manager says, here's the budget, if you want to make changes to it, you're responsible for make shifting the numbers around. Well, the city council said, we need this $50,000 for this project, so make sure it's in the budget. I also like to say they put their money where their mouth is or put our tax dollars where their commitment was. Then just a few weeks ago, Raleigh announced uh, Open Raleigh. It's basically our one-stop shop for open data. It's uh, got three parts to it. It uh, keeps the, has the open data component. It has uh, a citizen participation part. And uh, one, more, one part that I can't remember at the moment that it actually is a few slides away, um, open data sources like uh, web applications and things like that. So this is a quick screenshot of the landing page. You can see we've got uh, the, our geo portal, which if you're interested is actually powered by the Esri folks. So they've got a, a booth out here so you can go talk to them. Uh, and the, sec the middle part is web applications and mobile applications and, uh, and then the citizen part at the bottom. So I'll go in depth with some of these. Already alluded to the geo portal uh, powered by Esri on the back end. We've got over a, almost 100 layers of different GIS data available for the public to use. Uh, that includes things from zoning to roads to parks uh, and various maps that people would be interested in using. Another part of this is called uh, My Raleigh Ideas. 
This is a, basically a crowdsourcing platform. It's powered by a, a company called Granicus. And what they're doing now, so we're in the very early stages of our open data portal. And the city's be, being very frank and they're saying, hey, we've got two things we need to accomplish before we can really put, uh, accelerate the open data portal. We need to understand what our open data policy is. So we want you to input, we want to have your input on what that should look like. What type of licensing should things be released under? And so they're actively engaging citizens and users on what that should look like. The second part is to actually help them prioritize which data to focus on to get in the open data portal first. Right? It's great that we have all these GIS layers. That's awesome. But if the city is going to open source other things, let's say the budget, is that really a high priority from a citizen or a user perspective? So they're asking us, what is a high priority? Uh, another interesting thing they did is called My Rally Subscriptions. This is basically an email subscription management platform. There are a ton of them out there. This one actually specializes uh, in, in government solutions. This has actually saved me a bunch of email, right? Uh, because I'm so involved, I'd get the same email from three or four different people. I'd get it twice from the city. Now I can go in and opt in to the information that I want to receive, and I get it um, in a digest format or whatever, however frequent I want to get it. And it's been very successful from the city of Raleigh perspective. It's exceeded their expectations. I don't have the data behind it, but I've talked with the folks that implemented it, and they said they've seen a, a great uptick in the number of subscriptions um, on the system. Right, so uh, kind of summarizing all that, right, so the city of Raleigh isn't going out and building these uh, applications all by themselves. They're leveraging other, uh, you know, the, the open government ecosystem to deploy many of these things. I didn't talk about C-Click Fixed uh, in this presentation earlier because it was actually deployed about a year and a half ago. C-Click Fix is an open 3.11 platform that allows citizens to report non-emergency issues to the city. Um, they've got a website and also a mobile application. So if you're walking down the sidewalk and you see a down tree limb, you can take a picture of it with your cell phone. It's got your location and it, re it reports it to the city. What they do is they get that information to the right department so that that problem can be resolved. Uh, other popular things that people do with it is to report potholes or graffiti or those type of things. Uh, and I've seen a great, uh, I've had a great experience with it. Um, things get resolved within a day, two days, three days. Uh, there are things that take you know, longer, but the point is it's actually streamlining all the process. You as a citizen, you don't need to go figure out what's, what phone number or what department to call, get the runaround from that department or not get a call back. The, the city's taking care of that on the back end and streamlining it to the folks who can take care of the problem first. And actually, after they deployed it, they became more efficient at some of those things. They discovered that one department, or excuse me, that um, one issue coming in could actually go to three different departments. So now they figured out that it should just go to one department and, and uh, resolve that quicker. And so I just kind of put the question out there, what other new businesses can emerge in this open government ecosystem um, because of open data and because of some of the things that we make available? Oh, I thought it was a fire alarm. Or is that my time? <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, so uh, the, the, the cool piece about this is when the city of Raleigh released their open government resolution, they also released a roadmap with it, and it's a partnership with the citizens and the businesses that are really involved with this stuff. And so they laid out a roadmap, and they said, you know, this is where we want to take the next pieces, and the citizens are actively uh, engaged in, in many of those steps. So uh, this is brand new stuff. Uh, this just happened last weekend. We held the second City Camp Rally uh, ever, <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, basically it's three days, so I'll describe the conference, the, the unconference. The first day is more structured, it's Friday afternoon. We have a panel, uh, two panels, a government panel and a business panel. And this year we actually introduced lightning talks, which are five minute talks um, that are you know, on a variety of topics. Saturday is our unconference portion of the camp. It's where uh, we basically say, we're gonna have stuff from nine to five, and if you've ever been to an unconference, you create the agenda right there that morning based on who's there. And in this picture, you can see um, the grid was empty. We call it the grid, but on the wall there, we basically had five slots with five different rooms, and we fill that up based on people making one minute pitches on topics they were interested in. And then between Saturday and Sunday, most people call it a hackathon. We were calling it a civicathon. Uh, we, got, we paired up developers with citizens and city staff and, uh, and developed different applications in the course of 24 hours. So uh, we had 10 teams compete for a uh, $5,000 prize. And the team that won uh, created a, an application called Our Greenway. 
And this, the idea was really simple. So the girl in the blue shirt holding the sign here uh, made a pitch on Saturday morning that said, how many of you use the greenways? And a lot of hands went up. And then she goes, how many of you have gotten lost on a greenway or gotten to the trailhead and not know how to connect to the next greenway? Um, and so, you know, a lot of hands went up as well. So what they did in, in a matter of 24 hours was they used open data from the GIS portal that had uh, the, the greenway maps and parking information. They combined it with, uh, they integrated it with C-Click Fix, and then they combined it with, uh, I think, AccuWeather, and they made an application for the user that's able to basically show them where they can park if they're, gonna, if they're driving to a greenway and need to park, um, how the greenways connect, and uh, they developed this prototype in a very short amount of time. And so uh, they won the $5,000, they're very happy, and uh, I've learned uh, just today that they've already had one meeting since the, since the event last week and are gonna continue to develop this application. So uh, where I see all this going uh, is that City Camp for me has been a catalyst for the open government movement in Raleigh. And you can see all these different things that are happening, right? We, we can't take credit for all of them, but at least we can take credit for inspiring or, or the people involved with City Camp have been involved with a lot of these different initiatives. We're, uh, we're really good friends with the Raleigh IT department. A lot of people ask, you know, how do I start this in my city? Well, you've got to have an IT department that is at least one familiar with open source, uh, but we're just lucky and blessed enough to have an IT department that is advocate for open source. And really, I think all these things are, are leading us to um, the open source city for Raleigh. And what does that mean for me? So there are a couple different things. One, it's attracting more open source companies to the area. Um, that can be, you know, Red Hat is, uh, re is gonna be moving downtown, so that's very exciting. But how do we have other smaller open source companies, uh, startups or, you know, satellite offices for some of the larger ones that are on the West Coast or around different areas of the country? Uh, it's attracting open source conferences, <clears throat> self, um, OzCons, those type of things. We can, you know, get some of those in Raleigh. We can uh, make some progress there. We also do a lot of support of our different user groups. So I know Red Hat, um, host meetings for people like our Triangle Linux user group and our Triangle Drupal user group and other user groups like that that really just need a place to meet uh, so they can do their business and, and share information. It's also a large part of it is our culture, right? So the reason why Triangle Wiki is such a success in Raleigh is because we have a culture of open source already and uh, we have that mindset of sharing and building on each other's ideas. And uh, it's this whole open government talk thing, thing that I've been talking about today. Uh, so that's all I have. I'm happy to take uh, questions. I always want to leave, leave time for questions because there's usually a few in the audience. Uh, but if you need my contact details, here they are. And uh, take any questions that you have. Don't be shy. Yes. So the question is, is the, open, is the uh, bus system open data, G is the GIS is on, is basically can we track the bus, right? Um, I believe it is, and so I don't know too much about those details, but um, at last year's city camp, there was a lot of talk about putting like, QR codes and getting SMS enabled uh, mes messages for when the next bus would arrive. So um, I I'm pretty sure that that is something that we have. I don't know if it's utilized that well. Um, we actually have two different bus systems in Raleigh. We've got the local Raleigh one. We also have one specifically for NC State, and um, it's called the Wolf Line. And that one is GPS enabled. In fact, um, one of the guys I work with has it up all the time, is always watching when the next bus is coming so he can make his connection. So I think the city has it as well. Yeah. So uh, I don't work for the city of Raleigh, so I can't speak directly to that. Um, my, my assumption would be that, or, or from what I know, is that the, the state of North Carolina already uses Esri and Wake County already uses Esri, so it was easier to integrate with uh, the other kind of layers of government that were already around them. So my guess is that probably had a large influence on their selection of that software. Great, so the question is, uh, how do you explain open source to officials, right? 
Um, it's tough, right? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's great if you have an, an existing advocate on, on the council. And so we were lucky because one of our, um, one of our planners from, uh, one of our city camp planners is a city councilor. And so he was a huge advocate for us. Um, it does take a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. You've got to sit down and explain. You've got to use analogies that they understand. The recipe one is, is a great analogy. Uh, in fact, uh, I, didn't, I should have mentioned this, but at this year's city camp, we had every single city councilor plus our mayor attend. And I think it's, as far as I know, it's the first time in city camp history that that's occurred. You know, that, that to me says that they are committed, right? They, they didn't just pass this open government resolution. They're actually, you know, ha we had three of them actually participate in our civic hackathon on Sunday. We had, you know, on two different teams, they presented, presented ideas alongside normal citizens or alongside their, you know, their citizens. Uh, you know, that goes a lot towards to, to kind of restoring trust in government. I think a lot of the stuff gets lost in, you know, Everyone, we're all working pretty hard, right? And, and we don't have time to pay attention to all this stuff. So because there's a lack of transparency in government, people you know, reduce their trust. Um, but like I said, it's just, it is a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, so you've got to spend time explaining to them why it's important, um, why transparency is important, why um, open source is better, right? If you start off on the technology approach, sometimes it's just not going to resonate with them. You know, we've got one city councilor who's very traditional, feet on the street. And, uh, and so you've got to kind of think about how, is, how can you translate what open source is to a very traditional guy that takes phone calls on his, you know, rotary phone. I don't know if it's rotary, but, you know, <laughs> on his rotary phone at home at night, you know, talking to his citizens and going door to door. And, and you know, that's how he builds his base. That's how he communicates with his representatives. Um, so does that give you a good sense or do you want me to... Yeah, so the summary of that comment just for the video is, uh, you know, it also depends on the makeup of your city councilor. If they're not very technology agnostic, it's going to take longer. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's a hard thing to do if they don't understand it. If they don't see the benefit in it, they don't see what's in it for them, then you're not going to make progress. And so it will take time. Um, we're just fortunate that we've got people that kind of get it. They see the, they see the value in it. Um, to be honest, I think having Red Hat in the, in the, in the back door helps out a lot, right? So... Uh, they, they kind of see the economic development side of it, and maybe that's another angle, and especially with ITology, you know, it's, that's, you know, in part economic development and trying to do some more training and trying to get people in work, to work in open source and, and technology. So maybe that angle will, will help out too. Did you have a question over here? I think, no? Yeah? I was gonna ask, did you have contacts with the people in the IT department or anybody on the So the question is, do we have contacts? So you're telling me, me personally, or? Yeah, you developed this. Did you already have, you know, people in the IT department that came with you, or did you go directly to them? Yeah. So, yeah, so the question is, did we already have contacts in, you know, with the city council and with the IT department? And so for me personally, because I was involved as a citizen beforehand, I, you know, I've got half the city councilors on my cell phone. I can call them up and, and you know, we can just, you know, just talk. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, yeah, so the question is the order of, order of things. Should you go IT first and then mayor or mayor then IT? I say I'm a kind of a shotgun approach kind of guy. Like, you've got you've to work top down and bottom up, right? And so um, for me, I already had a lot of the relationship with city council, so I didn't have that uh, as good of a relationship with the IT department. Um, in fact, when I was looking back and reflecting on all this stuff, one of the things that helped me is the city was redoing their website, and they were looking for, you know, kind of, Web, pe web savvy people um, to help them, you know, look at previews and give them some feedback. And so they made a task force around, you know, the, the relaunch of the website. So I got involved with that. And so that kind of helped me form a relationship with the IT folks. Um, and, and I think, you know, if there's opportunities like that to definitely take advantage of it, or if there's a, a citizen 
kind of empowered um, you know, group or even if you've got um, an organization where you can ask them to come be a guest speaker at something and give an update. It's those little small things that kind of build up over time that makes it easier to say, hey, have you seen this open source solution? I think it'd be great you know, for the city to check into and see if it will save, save us some tax dollars. Um, so just you know, little small things that you can do to basically do some relationship building um, or even just kind of you know, shine a light on some of the great work they're doing. You know, a lot of times they get, they get more complaints than compliments. And so that's one thing you know, that everyone can use more of is, hey, you're doing a great job on this and let me share your story for you because you know, they're, they're dealing with a whole different world. Um, you know, they're dealing with the city press that you know, they've got to jump through hoops to get information out there. And um, so having advocates in the community to highlight the great things that are, they're doing is also a good idea. So the question is around um, kind of the relationship between open source, open data, and how people are trained uh, to use Microsoft to access their city. Is that accurate? Uh, so you know, we're in the same boat, right? We started off and it's very you know, Microsoft trained heavy. Uh, in fact, I know that uh, I went to look at a city council meeting last week because I couldn't be there in person and it asked me to install Silverlight. I think there is a program moon something. Um, maybe so there's some really smart person in the audience that knows what the plugin, the equivalent plugin is. What's it called? Moonlight? Is it called Moonlight? Something, it's moon something, but. Yeah. So uh, I know as far as the, is that as far as kind of streaming video is concerned, um, there is, a, there is something in process to change that to, to actually provide a little bit more open video to that. But um, on, on our panel last week at City Camp, we had the CIO Gail Roper actually kind of talk about this relationship. And she, she said, you know, we're, we're starting with open source, we're moving to open data, but really the end goal is to have open access, right? And so that means that not only are we putting the data out there, but it's also making things easily consumable for citizens, right? And I think that kind of speaks to some of the, the, the the um, silver light stuff, or it's not just putting a big, you know, unreadable CSV file out there so that people can go, all right, hey, there's open data. We don't have, we, we check the box on open data. It's making it, you know, interactive, and it might be putting a chart, you know, making graphs and things out of that data. And I think that's where the citizens can help. You know, if, we, if the city's gonna step forward and put open data out there, what can we do with our programming knowledge and our and, uh, experts and open, expertise in open source? What can we do to make things better, a better experience for people, right? We've got a lot of smart coders out there um, that are eager to do basically civic hacking. And um, it's just great when we can kind of take it to the next level for them because our governments, you know, are just like us. We've got tight budgets. Um, and so we've got to be a little thriftier in, in how we want to participate in our government and how we want to make our government easier for us to use. So, I mean, does that help a little bit or, I mean, did I totally dodge it? Okay.
so the, the summary for the folks in the video is that um, we have a, almost a responsibility and obligation to show our government how things can be easier. Because we are in this every day and, and we see how easy it is to use technology, um, we can actually flip the tables and make them advocates for us by just taking a few minutes and showing them, hey, look, this is really easy to do. Here's how you do it. So it's, I think it's kind of that crawl, walk, run mentality. And so, um, you know, similar story. Uh, I just got a new HTC phone and I'm coming from Blackberry so it's like a whole different world for me and I had uh, the city councilor who was on city camp like actually showing me how to use my phone he's like check this out man and he just showed me how easy it was and now I actually feel more of an expert I don't have to go read the 600 page manual just from him taking a few minutes to show me a little couple things on my phone because he had that expertise in that technology or has more expertise than me in that technology and he took a few minutes just to share that with me and and just because we were you know hanging out next to each other. But you know, in summary, it's you know, obligation to, to take our knowledge and share it with them in a very simple way, right? To show them that it's easy to use and make them advocates for us. Any more questions? Great, well, um, I'll hang out for a little bit if you don't want to ask a question on the, on the clock, but I'm um, happy to share my open source story with you, and uh, it's changing all the time, so and like I said, I just had to add in the city camp stuff, and the city's moving at such a rapid pace now. Uh, I like to say that you know, we may be a little bit behind in, uh, in the open source city stuff, but uh, we're going to slingshot past a lot of these other cities, and uh, I think Raleigh, if it isn't already, is going to be a great leader uh, in showing how uh, open source can be applied beyond technology. So thank you for your time today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. 
it definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects. And there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.